any comments or answer or ask any questions, you can do so by uh, clicking the microphone button that's circled in red in this slide at the top of your screen. Uh, during the presentation, you can also use the chat feature, which is uh, at the top of your screen, and we've circled it in the green button um, in the slide uh, for you to ask uh, any questions or uh, make any comments. We will go over those um, at the end of our time together. Um, finally, because we are in rural Arkansas and we know we have a lot of interest from rural communities across the country, um, if you are a uh, internet connection is a bit slow. We recommend turning off the your video. Um, you can click the cam recorder icon at the top of your screen and it's circle in purple here in this slide. So with that, I'll um, transition into our agenda. Like Jordan said, we have a lot to cover today. Um, so I wanted to first frame our conversation um oh, oh, and and discuss what we are going to cover uh in today's session so first we want to discuss uh, and provide an overview of the project that brought us here today and, and that is the usda rpic project that windrock is implementing with our project partners many of whom you're, you'll hear from uh today uh, and how it can be a model for leveraging statewide initiatives uh to spur community and economic development in rural communities then we're going to discuss the united states it's bike route 80 ask the statewide initiatives that brought this project together um, and uh, provide an overview of the role of broadband and mobile connectivity uh, into ensuring that statewide or broader initiatives uh, truly have an economic impact in rural communities. At the end, we're going to close with just a sneak peek of placemaking projects that communities in this RPIC project are implementing currently uh, to enhance broadband and also facilitate tourism through the USBR 80 designation. I'm certainly not going to cover all of that today, so we have a great uh, panel of speakers this morning. Uh, you'll, I think many of you will find um, this to be a, a, an excellent group of presenters and industry professionals um, that cover a wide range of topics. So you'll hear from Dave Roberts. He's a senior vice president of development at Craft and Toll. You'll also hear from Lisa Fraser, who is a physical activity coordinator for UAMS SPAN, and from Chip SPAN, who is vice president of engineering and technical services at Connected Nation. Uh, I'll go over their bios um, right before uh, it's their turn to present, uh, just for the sake of time. But um, with that, let's let's jump right in. So I mentioned that we're going to start today by covering uh, the project that brought us here today, and that's the USDA Rural Placemaking Challenge. Um, this project is funded by USDA, as I mentioned, and with our project partners, uh, Windrock is implementing this project in four mid-Delta communities in Arkansas. It, the communities are the city of England, the city of Lone Oak, the city of Stuttgart, and Helena, West Helena. When we were designing this project, we were exploring uh, communities that would be a good fit for placemaking activities, and we turned to the USBR BR 80 route designation as the connecting threat um, for communities where, where we thought this type of work could have a lot of impact. So, uh, we did that intentionally because in recent years, there has been a lot of discussion about cycling and tourism as a strategy to spur economic development. Um, but we knew that for rural communities to truly take advantage of this, there had to be a lot of preparation, uh, a lot of placemaking, and truly a lot of community development. Uh, so we designed our pick uh, and this project to provide planning and implementation capacity assistance to facilitate locally driven efforts to improve quality of life uh, the rural economy, technological innovation, e-connectivity or broadband uh, um, along these four communities in the mid-delta region of Arkansas. The technical assistance that we cover in this project uh, includes an assessment of community needs through uh, using a community capitals framework, uh, walkability assessments, using data to develop placemaking plans that, in, that enrich the vibrancy and accessibility of place in these local communities, assessing the current conditions of broadband um, and mobile connectivity, which you'll hear us reference as e-connectivity at times, um, as well as 
helping the local communities implement already on the ground efforts of place making, like developing master bicycle pedestrian plants, designing art components and tourism resources, and leveraging partnerships uh, for continued implementation. With this technical assistance, it is our hope that the communities in this project will be better prepared to capture the social and economic capitals produced by state investments in cycling and broadband. So uh, this work uh, really has three main components, um, and, and these are all interconnected and crucial uh, for this work to be effective. So we are leveraging first the strong cultural identity of these communities and the region. We know that the Delta region is a culturally rich uh, region, and these communities have a heritage and uh, uniqueness uh, that has to be leveraged for community development. Where they also have uh, already current and ongoing placemaking efforts. So the work that we are conducting is just a way for us to facilitate and amplify the work that's already being done at the local level. Um, and we wanted to facilitate it in light of uh, innovative statewide initiatives focused on enhancing broadband and expanding cycling infrastructure and tourism through rural communities. In addition to amplifying the local planning and implementation efforts, RPIC is, was also designed to foster sustainability and resilience for project development by creating a collaborative regional network of community leaders and partners. And I'll go into this a little bit more uh, in the next couple of slides. So to do this work, and as I've mentioned, uh, this is not something that can be done alone, and we need a full webinar to truly discover and go over the partnership development that, that is needed for this work to be successful. But for this project, we're working hand in hand with a wide variety of organizations um, that to, to leverage and capitalize on very varied and um, and specialized technical expertise and experience. So you'll see that we have Connected Nation, which is a leader in, in, in uh, increasing broadband accessibility across the country. Uh, we're working with Craft and Toll, who is an award-winning design uh, and architectural firm um, that has been very engaged in master bicycle pedestrian plans um, across the state, as well as urban planning. UAMS Span, who has been working in, in this space for many years, uh, along with Craft and Toll, um, if focusing around how the built environment can lead to healthier and more accessible communities. And we're also working with other uh, local organizations like Thrive, um, more geared towards the implementation uh, a, of placemaking and using design um, to le really leverage the tourism assets that are in place. Uh, I mentioned that this work was funded by USDA, but truly this work, um, in, in this work, USDA has been a great partner. Uh, they have been engaged uh, in every aspect of the project and providing direct technical assistance uh, to the beneficiaries community. So um, we wanted to highlight this to show that for projects like these to be successful and to truly have an impact in the local communities, there has to be collaboration among many uh, different organizations and, and funders. And, and these four, this five uh, not even cover a a sliver of all the organizations that are behind these uh, communities and have been working in these communities for years. Our project partners in Windrock um, are implementing this project following a tier technical assistance approach um, that utilizes the Arkansas Hub criteria, uh, which you will learn more about uh, in, in a little bit, um, as a pilot tool to generate innovative placemaking efforts in communities that are primed for to attract cycling tourism along major routes uh, and trails. Uh, the approach that we're following follows the community development process uh, from planning and assessment to implementation to sustainability and expansion. And you'll see that each of the communities um, where we're working are at different stages of this development or community development cycle. And that was intentional. Uh, we wanted to allow and provide technical assistance in this project that would allow each of the communities to grow from their unique stage of capacity while at the same time fostering regionalism 
um, by facilitating learning and mentorship across these communities as they are connected through the USBR AD designation. So I think this is a good segue for a deep dive into what the USBR 80 is, how it came about, and also the Hub Communities Framework. Um, and for that, we'll have two speakers. First, we're going to have Dave Roberts, who is the Vice President of Business Development and Director of Planning at Crafton Toll & Associates. Dave has over 30 years of experience and is responsible for overseeing and contributing to site planning and urban design projects that include community development plans, parks and recreation systems plans, bicycle and pedestrian network plans, and he has received several awards for his work, including the Asla Merritt Award for Pulaski County Pedestrian and Bicycle Trails Master Plan and the Arkansas Chapter APA Achievement in Urban Design Award for the 12th Street Corridor Plan in Little Rock, Arkansas. We're also going to hear from Lisa Fraser, who is a coordinator for the state physical activity and nutrition projects at the University of Arkansas for Medical Science UAMS SPAN. With over 30 years of experience, Lisa is responsible for coordination, logistics, outreach and implementation of SPAN projects and for primary intervention, uh, prevention, built environment interventions related to obesity and promoting physical activity in the development. In in, in, in to increase access to healthy food. Uh, Lisa has been in, instrumental in developing uh, the Arkansas Statewide Master Pedestrian and Bicycle Plan, uh, gaining designations for rural communities in Arkansas in the U.S. bike route, uh, and serves in a variety of leadership roles related to placemaking, including Metro Plan Advisory Board for Imagine Central Arkansas. So Dave and Lisa, uh, take it away. All right. Um, thanks, Michelle. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the U.S. Bike Route 80 feasibility study that we performed. Um, it was funded by a UAMS grant. Um, and my next slide will show you the purpose of that. And that was really to determine a safe and interesting route between Memphis and West Memphis and Little Rock or North Little Rock. Um, and, you know, connecting obviously two rivers, but uh, metropolitan areas on either end and these rural communities through the middle. Um, and on my next slide will show you the the partners that were part of that feasibility study project. And like I said, uh, it was a, a grant through UMS. So Lisa was our, our commissioning agency. And then uh, RDOT, which is our highway department, um, as well as state parks. And then we were the consultants that uh, led the effort. Um, so what is a US bike route? Uh, and, and some people, if you click one more time, you'll, you'll see that where 80 falls in um, the map, one just, Click one more, advance the slide and you'll see, there you go, there's 80. Um, and, and in yellow, you can see where we're talking about from Memphis to, to Little Rock. Um, but there are bike routes across the country. Believe it or not, people will get on a, a, a bicycle and ride multiple states over multiple days, even weeks. Um, but it was kind of a donut hole uh, on the national map, at least from the standpoint of Arkansas and through Oklahoma. And so um, we wanted to see how that connection could occur um, and on the next slide, you'll see that really some of these ideas came out of the statewide bicycle and pedestrian master plan that we teamed with Tool Design Group on uh, for the state of Arkansas. And Lisa was a big part of that. Um, and it was looking at three potential routes. When we got down to do the actual feasibility study, we really honed in on the two that made the most sense. And so I'm going to show you that um, in a minute. I think we're first going to talk about hub communities because that also came out of the statewide plan. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dave. When we started looking at USBR 80, we were trying to determine how we could match the communities to bicycle tourism and allow cyclists to make the determination of planning their trip. Because cyclists have to plan how much they're going to ride each day how many days they want to stay somewhere um, and, and the amenities. So um, we brought together a team where we had RDOT, uh, myself, Crafton and Tull. We also had the Governor's Task Force on Cycling and Metro Plan and the Division of Economic Development all come together 
oh, and I'm sorry, our state's parks, um, tourism and heritage. And we all came together trying to get everybody's points across, but make this a very easy um, criteria to fill. Um, and also work with the communities who were hub communities uh, to uh, do placemaking with active transportation and how to grow with that. Um, next slide, please. So we had to first think of what were the reasons? Why were we going to be able to talk communities into wanting to become hub communities? Um, and really, our governor stated it well that cycling is Arkansas's tourism. We're really growing between my, mountain bike trails, road bikes, um, travelers. It is becoming a huge um, economic development for the state. And we wanted these communities to be able to um, hone in on this um, economic development opportunity as the route came through their community. And you can see, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but basically what it's saying is that cyclists spend a lot of money. Um, they want to they wanna ride, they want to eat, typically they want to have a beverage of their choice, and we wanted to set up communities to be able to re reap the benefits of each cyclist. Um, and that's kind of how we looked at the hub communities and why these rural communities needed to find their niche, needed to find what they offered, something special, something that really wanted um, to have a cyclist stop. Uh, next slide, please. And if we looked at having a broad look, we needed to have different areas, different uh, companies, different organizations all be on board. We had to have business owners. We had to have medical individuals. We had to have the cities. We had to have places for them to go, places for them to stay. Um, we needed just also, we needed the cyclists, if they stopped in that town, to be able to walk somewhere or easily bike somewhere and it be safe. And so we needed to help these communities become more walkable, more bikeable, and be set up for multimodal transportation. And that is where we came in for technical assistance and understanding what active transportation really is. And also, I do work for UAMS and the health benefits of traveling by cycle or by walking to everyday destinations helps reduce chronic diseases and obesity. And so that is hugely important. And we have found that people who are connected to their community are happier and healthier when they're able to get out, feel safe, walk to their hairdresser, walk to the grocery store, ride their bike. They just feel more connected to that community. Next slide. So this is what we came up with. Again, we tried to keep it very easy. And Arkansas is the diamond state. So we came up with a four diamond tier. Um, and you can see we cover basic amenities, which is food, lodging, and water, and then medical and support services, uh, safe and better routes, local commitment, and then attraction. And let me kind of explain each one of those. Basic amenities is hotels, 
motels, campgrounds, even a rural community saying, hey, we have this huge park. We're going to provide um, a hot spot and we'll provide electricity and you can camp here. Um, also having uh, some discounts for uh, cyclists, you know, to attract them to stay. Everybody likes to save money. But we also realize that there are some uh, medical and support services. So when we decided to do the hub community criteria, we needed to see if they had a medical clinic, if there was 24 hour services, if they had an emergency room, if they had ambulance services. Um, then we looked at the actual roads and the traffic and the bridges and how wide the shoulders were. So you can see this was a huge undertaking that took a lot of people and boots on the ground. And I bring up local commitment because in Arkansas, the way we run our model is we do not come into a community unless the mayor is on board and at the table. And we have certain criteria. The mayor has to be at the table at all times, superintendent, um, a council member. Um, that just ensures, you heard Michelle speak of it, but sustainability and continued place making. Um, I will say the culture of cycling, they like to have a good meal and they like to have a good beverage. Um, so attractions do count. They also want to go see stuff. You know, what's in your community? What do you have to offer? You know, maybe you have um, a park that you do movies in the park or you do concerts. And then communities get recognition. So we'll um, we're building a website. We'll have a there's a designated map. We're applying for adventure cycling um, designation. Um, we do uh, walk audits. We do livability workshops for these communities so that they can understand what a hoop community is and what it can do for them economically, place making, and just their community overall. Next slide. And Dave, I'm going to return it to you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. So I'm going to talk to you about the feasibility study and the process that we went through. As I mentioned before, we were initially three routes, but we narrowed it down to these two. So we're looking at a northern and a southern, and so you'll hear me refer to them that way. And the next slide, I'll show you um, just what what we were looking for. You know, of these routes and these corridors, which one had the highest tourism potential? They connected cities. Um, was it reasonably direct? Were there options for getting off the main route to see other uh, amenities in the region? Um, and what about the services? Like Lisa just mentioned, all those hub community designation options, whether it's eating or, or lodging um, or convenience. Um, and so the next slide will show you that, the next two slides will show you, we looked at um, both infrastructure, what things we could measure, um, and then things that we couldn't measure, but we wanted to evaluate. And, that, and the first one was infrastructure, the second one is amenities. Um, and so that, you know, that took quite a bit of data gathering, and then eventually I'll show you how we went out in the field and verified it. Um, but we also, in the very beginning on the next slide, you'll see we created some score sheets for each segment of this entire route, which is about 165 miles. Um, we want to know what the average daily travel was, what the truck volume is, what the speeds are. I mean, all the things that we could get um, from RDOT. I think on the next slide, I'll show you where most of our data sources were. A lot of it was RDOT road inventory information um, and then recommendations from the RDOT statewide plan. Of course, we had to get from UMS um, or other uh, local uh, with urgent care centers, health centers, um, and then just try to uh, manually um, find that information. And, and sometimes those things are even just conveniences like, is it a shaded route? Um, you know, are there municipal parks nearby? Uh, what's the downtown like? What are the bridge issues? So uh, you'll hear me talk about some of this and it came from this data gathering that we had to do in the beginning. In these next few slides, and, and we can go through them quickly, this is average daily travel. Um, if it's red, like the interstate there, which we're not going to be on, um, uh, you know, you can see the greens aren't as bad 
Um, that's just how many car trips there are per every road in that region. The, the next slide is what the travel lane widths are, um, the actual road widths, um, and the slide after is how many, uh, what the width of the shoulders are, because remember we're on bicycles next to vehicular travel, so we really had to analyze those shoulder widths and where you see red, red meaning not as good versus uh, yellow or green. Uh, and I know faintly you can see the route, but it was primarily yellow as we were analyzing it. The next slide will show you the truck count, which was real important. We wanted to uh, make sure that these were safe routes if we're gonna recommend these on a national um, scale. And so, um, and, and then health, the, the next slide shows you, we did some analysis to try to figure out where the health clinics were, what level of clinic they were and how they could respond to the needs of those tourists. And then the next slide is kind of the boots on the ground that, oh, back one, that Lisa mentioned, and these are just the team partners that went out. So we did a two day reconnaissance um, and we started in Little Rock and North Little Rock and we took two different cars. One car looked at the route itself, mostly inventoried um, the roads and the bridges, and the other one looked at the amenities of the towns and, and, and some of the tourist um, options that were there. And I think the next few slides are just showing you pictures of us out, um, like that's the, the route team that was with a measuring wheel, measuring the bridges and the shoulder widths and the, the, the roads themselves. On the next slide, I'll show you uh, the amenity team. We went into every one of the towns on both north and south route. So we went over to Memphis the first day, hitting all the towns, looking at the roads and bridges, spent the night together, both teams um, in West Memphis, and then came back the northern route, did the same thing. Um, and then I think the last slide, yeah, is just the soft assets. But you know, these are important. Uh, oh, back one. Uh, whether it's shade or whether it is local character, um, obviously political support. When we see signs that say no access, stay off, um, we need to know what, what we're looking at and, and roadside amenities, whether it's farmers markets or, or any other tourist um, items that might be of interest. So, uh, and then the next slide uh, is just making sure those connections made sense to other routes, other trails, whether they're vertical, you know, north and south along the Arkansas River, or whether they're going across the country, if we intersect another um, national USBR route, um, and along the Mississippi, and of course, the crossing of the Harahan Bridge, which is the big river crossing at the Mississippi River into Memphis. Um, and so all those connections needed to be w weighed out too to determine the best route. Uh, and and then we everything we did with field work, we geo-referenced our photographs so that we could identify everywhere we took pictures and what we were looking at, whether it was the road conditions, bridge conditions, or even um, the amenities in the town. So that's just what this shows here. And so the northern route had some pluses, had some minuses, same with the southern. They both had good and bad things, but we had to do it um, sort of systematically to figure out you know, what was best. I'll show you the, those score sheets in a minute. But the next slide just shows a survey. We really want to get input from folks who have been on these routes. We were and did um, field verify them on bicycle, but we also want to talk to people who um, were familiar with the, some of the stakeholders in the group. And so they told us things that were they felt were important, whether it was distance to um, different amenities or distance between campgrounds or you know the bridge crossings. What were the things that when they're doing bicycle tourism, that there are bigger concerns to help us evaluate. And so when it came down to the next slide, you'll see it was tight. The scoring was really close. Um, the, the, the distances were almost identical, 162 versus 165. Um, but scoring on the sheets that we used to score it, the southern route um, came out just a little ahead. And so that is the route we went with. And so that's the one that takes you here on the map from West Memphis on the right side of the screen through Mariana, um, through Clarendon, through Stuttgart, uh, through England, and then straight up into North Little Rock. Uh, on the left side of the screen. So um, that's where we then honed in and started to do more of the feasibility study. Um, and and then and most of it was proofing. Now we said, okay, this is the preferred route. We've driven them both. We've investigated everything. We've got the data. We've got the rider preference. Let's get on the road with some teams and see how it feels. And so we broke this segment, the 165 miles into for uh, three teams um, and we rode those with support vehicles, um, stopped for lunch and then kept riding. So each team did you know, roughly 60 miles or, or 65 or ish. Um, and we wore, most of us wore vests to make sure it was safe. And I will say um, 
I got to ride. I'm an avid cyclist. So I, I, this was a great day for me. It was a little bit cool, but any day I get paid to ride my bike is a great day in my book. Um, so the next slide, you'll see us um, riding. And then all three teams uh, tried to meet uh, in Memphis and, and had dinner together. You can see that top picture where um, at the near the Harriham Bridge, the river crossing. We actually did go over into Memphis to, to see a little of the city and then came back. Um, and those support vehicles, RDOT provided support uh, on, on two of the three teams. Uh, it was great. It was a lot of great help and a good team coordination. And so we verified this is what we want to do. And this last slide, is, uh, my last slide is going to show you um, kind of the summary of what was next. And it was really the partnerships and municipalities and the counties, you know, all that coordination that Lisa is going to next talk about um, and also getting support um, in those resolutions. But really the very next step would be RDOT applying for that designation through AASHTO, which is kind of the national clearinghouse for those U.S. bike routes. Um, and then also state parks, along with our group, rolling out the Hub Communities Plan, um, that program that Lisa just explained to you. So, but, you know, partnership, a huge part of it, right, Lisa? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, you're right. Um, partnership is hugely important. Um, and really, it's an all hands on deck. Um, you can see we have Lone Oak, we have Thrive, we have Windrock Craft and Toll, Parks and Recreation, our Cooperative Extension, RDOT, CDC, Stuttgart, England, and the uh, NACDD, all and Connect Nation, all of these have a part in the US uh, DA, I mean, USBR, sorry. <laughs> part of 80 um, all together. Um, what, what we found was there were pieces that the USDA grant could fund. There were pieces that UAMS SPAN could fund. There was technical assistance that Winrock could provide, that Thrive could provide, that UAMS SPAN could provide. Um, to each one of these communities. And so it took so much collaboration and coordination. We could do an entire presentation just on this. So I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on this, but I needed you to know that it starts at the grassroots and then goes all the way up to the national level. Um, and that's how we had um, the success that I'm going to show you here in a little bit. So if we look at the next slide, um, this is the partnerships and how all of this came together. So we were fortunate enough, Winrock International and UAMS SPAN were fortunate enough to write for the Walk Action Institute Institute that is sponsored by NACDD, which is the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. Sorry, those acronyms sometimes get me. And so it, we were awarded that. And so during the Walk Action Institute, we had to do photo voices. And if you look at the um, upper left, we did walk audits. Um, we did walk audits in Stuttgart. We did walk audits in um, Lone Oak. We did walk audits in England. We did walk audits in Helena, West Helena. Um, and so we pulled all of this information together and said, look at this. Um, and part of the Walk Action Institute is you have to devise a um, action plan. Well, guess what? With the USDA RPIC, they have an economic development action plan they have to develop. So it, all these pieces are fitting together. During the walk audit and during the photo voices, we saw opportunities. So we did some pop-ups. We did pop-ups of bulb outs and um, crosswalks. We did a pop up for a pocket park. Um, and then we said, OK, hey, Winrock International, hey, UAMS, hey, Craft and Toll, we need to take these 
to design. We need to start designing. And um, if you look up, the first picture is a trailhead design, and that's in Lone Oak. Um, we uh, provided them with this design, and you may not have heard us mention Lone Oak of the USBR 80, but they're on an alternative route, and they are a community that's not far from the route that has a lot of amenities and a lot of things to offer. So we felt it was important to add Lone Oak to this. The top right, that is the design of the um, pop-up for the crosswalks. Um, and I don't know if you can see the mural, but that's a duck because Stuttgart does uh, a duck festival every year and they uh, decide who the world champion for duck calling is in Stuttgart. Um, uh, we also did um, the pocket park rendition and uh, I'm proud to say that they were a finalist for an outdoor recreation grant to support that. Winrock International and UAMS SPAN uh, provided technical assistance with them and we're hoping to hear about that in um, I think December. The reason I bring all this up is all of this is technical assistance that we all had to come together to provide to get these communities from we need help to municipality involvement to livability workshops to walk audits to demonstration events to planning to implementation. Um, and then we have done some master pedestrian and bicycle plans. We did, we funded uh, phase one, UAMS SPAN funded phase one of Lone Oak and Winrock International funded um, the other three phases so that we could get that pulled together. Um, we, we're going to do a master pedestrian bicycle plan in England that Winrock International and UAMS SPAN is going to work together on. Um, I'm proud to say Craft and Atoll will be doing these. Um, and then uh, we're going to do, uh, we did Stuttgart. Uh, we got lucky enough that we had some carry forward and we were able to provide that to Stuttgart. So I say this just to show you this takes time. This just didn't happen overnight. Year one was the feasibility study and trying to get all of our ducks in a row. And then year two, reaching out to these communities. And then year three, doing the Walk Action Institute and getting them ready. And then in year four, we're doing plans and implementation. So I just wanted everybody to know that you know, this takes a while, uh, but you've got to have that foundation and and you've got to have the municipality and the influential community members on board for sustainability, for policy systems and environmental changes. Thank you, Lisa and Dave, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, in addition to all the technical assistance related to placemaking, community development, the built environment, um, and the partnership development that it takes to pull something like this off, uh, something that Windrock has been working over the, the past few years, even before COVID uh, shed a huge light into the need for reliable broadband in rural communities, um, is to increase the access of broadband uh, in rural communities in Arkansas. And when we were designing our pick, that was something that we knew it was necessary uh, for the communities in this route uh, to truly capitalize on the dollars that were hopefully going to flow as cycling tourism expanded through uh, this route. Uh, to do that, we uh, contracted with Connected Nation uh, to provide technical assistance and equip communities uh, about the knowledge knowledge and the tools that it takes to enhance broadband and mobile connectivity along the route. We knew that this was critical for safety, uh, but also to be able to highlight the assets that the community had and for local residents, not just tourists, to be able to live in their communities. So 
Our next speaker uh, is going to discuss the results of this work. Uh, his name is Chip Spann, and he is the Director of Engineering and Technical Services at Connected Nation. Uh, he is considered a pioneer in the development of two-way digital and high-speed data services during the 90s and has over 32 years of experience in multiple disciplines, uh, including executive leadership roles within the te telecommunication industry um, with an emphasis on M&A spectrum management. He performs engineering oversight of mobile drive testing, site plans, cost models, radio frequency propagation analysis, and he created uh, field validation and wireless uh, design models that were adopted as best practices by the FCC and the National Telecommunication Communications and Information Administration. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Chip. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me okay. We can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to apologize to everybody right off the bat. As I said earlier during the during the trial run for this, the uh, the problem with working on trying to solve the issues in the digital divide is that I'm always in the digital divide. So today is one of those days where, you know, I'm sitting out here in southern Oklahoma and I barely have a cellular connection to be able to make a telephone call and my internet connection is really bad. And, I, and I'm hoping that when I get ready to start doing my screen shares momentarily, um, that you'll be able to see my screen. If not, I'm just going to have to kind of walk you through what we did and, 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 and share with you some of the information that we found. So the first thing that I want to let you know is that we, at the end of this um, analysis that we worked on for Winrock, you heard earlier Lisa talking about the fact that you know, there have been analysis done in England and Lone Oak and Stuttgart. We were in all of those communities independent of the bike route. And what we were doing there was to analyze their broadband infrastructure and begin making recommendations for them about ways that their infrastructure could be improved. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that in Stuttgart, there's now a contract in place and Ritter Communications is offering fiber to the home for the first time in that community. In England and Lone Oak, we now have a company called Swift Connect offering fiber to the home. Uh, there, there's fixed wireless in these communities. There's high speed digital subscriber line. And so a lot of these rural communities that had kind of been on the tail end of the broadband um, infrastructure map are now moving towards the front. You know, we're starting to see massive improvements going on and a lot of activities that, that are improving broadband. And that's good because as it relates to the entire bike route, a lot of these are communities that you're gonna be traveling through, or a lot of these are communities that you're gonna be visiting or, or tourists are gonna be visiting. This also includes Helena, West Helena, even though it's not on the bike route, it's one of those tourist locations that's, that's close by. So as I begin uh, trying to, to, to do some screen sharing with you, the first thing that I'd like to try and do is show you a map, which is um, a, a map of Google Earth. I wanna talk to you about what we did to try and assist in this process. And hopefully everybody can see this map that pops up. This is the US 80 bike route. Um, and whether we're talking about the Southern end or the Northern end, we were tasked by Winrock as part of this partnership to literally drive the entire route and test the mobile signal for AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, and Verizon. Now, while this was going on, Sprint and T-Mobile were right in the middle of doing a merger. And, and, and because of that, um, a lot of the results of this test are gonna be skewed somewhat because the independent results for Sprint and the independent results for T-Mobile are now kind of aggregated together. But we literally drove the entire bike route at, you know, at, a, at about 10 to 15 miles an hour so that we could, we could test. When we had you know, two cellular telephones on our dashboard for each one of these providers. Um, and Every one of these little dots that you see represents a particular test. So in this case, what you're seeing now is the result of that test. It, it, it tells me that I was using a Samsung Galaxy S6. 
It tells me that I was on AT&T's network. It's got the results of my download speeds, my upload speeds, the latency, the signal strength, everything that you could possibly imagine. I mean, there's like thousands of rows of information for every one of these tests. When we got done with this, what we hoped to be able to do was to put together a map that kind of showed what the results were so that as, as bikers and their support crews or, or tourists coming through the area um, would have an understanding of where there were gaps in mobile coverage, where there were places they might need to try and find uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, <clears throat> et cetera. So all of these results ended up then uh, transforming into both a broadband report, which I'm going to try and toggle to in just a moment, as well as um, an interactive map. So on the broadband report, we provided this report to WinRock at the conclusion of our analysis. And this was done May of this year, so it's still relatively current. And we talked about the project background, you know, what, what was going on, why it was important, why people needed to be aware of gaps in coverage. You know, Dave was talking earlier about the fact that any day he can get on his bike is a good day. Well, what happens if poor old Dave falls off his bike and breaks an arm and, you know, and he's got to try and reach for his cell phone to call an ambulance or call 911 and he happens to be in an area where service doesn't work? We wanted to make sure that we could take all of that statistical data that we put together and kind of provide a map or some, some sort of forewarning that says, if you're an AT&T customer, you're about to have 14 and a half miles where your phone's not going to work. So, you know, this 14 and a half miles happens to be T-Mobile or it happens to be an area that Verizon has service in. So we took all of that information and we tried to homogenize it down into a report talking about how we did the work and, and what the work meant and, and, and tried to provide some recommendations for what was going on. Now, this table to me is kind of the nuts and bolts of what was done because this says if you look at the entirety of the bike route, you know, both the north and the south loop, here's what you have. If you're trying to do broadband connection on your phone, you know, you're trying to download videos or you're trying to check the weather forecast or even trying to do email, please know that of the entire route, 109 miles of it uh, is predominantly an area that's served by AT&T where you could get 25 megabit download speeds. Only 71 miles of the route are covered by T-Mobile and only 68 by Verizon. So in the aggregate, if you're trying to get a true broadband connection, and broadband, by the way, is defined by the Federal Communications Commission as 25 megabits download speed and three megabits upload speed. So if you're trying to get broadband connection, 176 miles of the bike route has it. If you're trying to get, uh, you know, other types of service, if, if you start coming down and, and saying, okay, I got 176 miles, now how are the other components broken down. Um, the bad news is that AT&T has 45 miles of no signal. T-Mobile's got 97 miles and Verizon's got 69 miles. And when we aggregated everything together to just try and find out where the dead zones are, we can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's 11 and a half miles roughly of that bike route that have absolutely no cellular service whatsoever. So this report is, is something that you know Winrock may be willing to share. And at the end, there is a map or a series of maps that kind of show these gap areas. Um, so what you're looking at now is if I wanted to have a broadband connection, where is it going to be located at? Well, that's what you see in the dark blue. Um, the areas that you see in, in, the, in the dark red are the gaps, and I know it's really difficult to see on this map, but I'm going to put my cursor right here and tell you that the bulk of this route, that the bulk of that 11 and a half miles or so, is right above my cursor. There's also one section right here where there's no coverage. So as we put this, this report together, 
and talked about um, what we had hoped could get accomplished. We also were trying to think about how these communities fit in. So as we've been having discussions with the folks in Lone Oak and England and Helena and Stuttgart and other places, we, we've talked about the fact that mobile service in your community may be spotty. You know, in one community, you may have marginal service with AT&T and no coverage from anybody else whatsoever. So what's, hap what's going to happen if people are coming through your town? How can you make service better? Well, you might consider putting in some free Wi-Fi hotspots or some access points where the bikers can come check in at a kiosk and say, you know, if you need to download data or you want to check the weather forecast, do it here. So I think all of those communities now kind of have that mindset that they understand that in order to enhance and encourage tourism, they have to try and have some skin in the game and make some sort of contribution to make not only broadband connectivity better, but something that can replace the lack of cellular coverage that they may be facing in their towns. Uh, the other item that I want to show you now is, is the interactive map that we put together so I can kind of try and explain to everybody, you know, what the results turned out to be and, and what we found as we were moving forward. As we began to analyze the data for these communities and, and for the bike route, um, the first thing that we had to do was download information that was available from all of the providers. Primarily, this data was downloaded via the Federal Communications Commission Form 477 uh, submission or Form 477 data. Providers typically have to provide some sort of report to the federal government a couple of times a year. And that's typically in March and September. So we said, okay, let's, let's have a look at this for a second. Let's assume that bikers may be anywhere on this route, may be veering off the path as far as five miles because they have to go find a hotel or they've got to find a restaurant or, or you know, a gas station, and there may not necessarily be one immediately on the path. So we built this buffer that you're now seeing on the screen that shows what that, that five mile area looks like. And then we began going in and saying, based on the federal data, show me what everybody is reporting. So according to AT&T, for example, well, by golly, they offer service to 100% of the bike route. Unfortunately, my testing did not concur with their, you know, their assessment. Um, we looked at companies like Sprint. And as, as you see, I've just clicked on Sprint. Man, there was like nothing in that particular area. There's, there it is. You know, it's very sketchy. And so when Sprint combined themselves with T-Mobile, what we ended up finding in the aggregate is something that's supposed to look um, like this. So even with Sprint and T-Mobile, you can clearly see that they're not claiming that they have 100% coverage. You can see the little spotty or sketchy areas throughout the bike route. And then finally, we come down to Verizon, who claims that they have the, you know, the most robust nationwide 5G network and all of all of the world and they claim that they have 100% coverage and I can assure you they do not. So we then started trying to pull in some other information for, for things and, and you probably won't be able to see this on the map a lot because a, a lot of this information is going to be driven by what's going on in Lone Oak or England or Stuttgart or Helena, but we started to bring in other information that says, show me maybe where AT&T offers DSL service. So right there, you can, and I'm going to move this map a little bit so you can see, you know, we've got AT&T supposedly offering DSL here and down around Helena, West Helena. Now, does AT&T offer? Yes, ma'am. Um, your screen is frozen, so we're looking at um, a map that has both the northern and southern route in orange. Could you try maybe refreshing or resharing your screen? If we can't get it to work, 
we understand that's okay, but just wanted to let you know it was frozen. Sure, let me let me try this again. Again, I, I apologize. Here I am in, you know, trying to talk to you about fixing this very problem and I'm sitting right in the middle of it. Okay, so let's see what happens this time when I turn the screen back on. Can you see it now? We we can. Um, it is uh, the orange north and south route with um, that light blue buffer around it. Yep. And so I've I've kind of started to zoom in towards the city of Lone Oak. There we go. Yeah, hope, it's going now. Okay. All right. So as we began to do these analysis in each of the communities, we tried to incorporate this into the bike route study. So if somebody says, gosh, if I don't, if I can't get cellular service, is there a place where I could at least stop in and, you know, maybe find a, a you know, the building, a library or something that's got service. So we, we, we had to understand what was going on in each town. So we looked at AT&T, uh, we looked at CenturyLink, Comcast, you know, all of the providers that were out there to try and figure out in the aggregate across that bike route, if there were other places that you needed to go to to try and get service, where might they be? So everything that you see now that should be lighting up on the screen with green and yellow and blue and purple blocks, these are all components of existing broadband infrastructure that's either within the route or nearby that five mile buffer. And for the most part, you can see that this is relegated, I think, to the communities of Lone Oak and England. And at the time we did this study, there was not a whole lot going on in Stuttgart. We had gone down and done an analysis on Suddenlink. Uh, CenturyLink did not offer broadband. Ritter Communications had not yet started their, their, their fiber to the home. And that's why you don't see a lot appearing here. So the good news is, in the time that I have been working with Winrock, we have seen massive improvements in the broadband uh, in these smaller communities, and we've started to see some pretty good improvement in the cellular coverage. One thing that has happened since this study was conducted is that T-Mobile decommissioned all of their 3G tower sites. Now that's important because if you're, you know, if you're still using a 3G phone, and many of you may have one, when you get to to these communities and you're trying to bike through, this is important because you can't connect to a 4G or a 5G tower with a 3G phone. Handsets are always backwards compatible, but they're never forward compatible. So one of the things that I think that, that it is, is kind of relevant for discussion here is to tell folks, to tell tourists, if you're coming into the area, and you're going to be relying heavily on mobile coverage, it would probably be very wise to make sure that you have a 4G or a 5G handset in your possession, or you may not be able to connect to a cellular net network at all. The other thing that has happened that has significantly changed somewhat uh, is that AT&T, as part of its national contract to develop the first net public safety network, has added some additional tower sites along the way. And so AT&T's road mileage or their coverage area has increased probably by 10 to 15% since the time that this test was conducted. So I'm, I'm not picking favorites by any stretch of the imagination, but if you go back to that, that uh, report that I showed you earlier, if they were already the leader in developing uh, cellular coverage along the bike route, and they've just made it better because of their commitment for their first net expansion, then I think that's also important for people to know. If you're going to be in the area and you're coming in with a T-Mobile phone or a Verizon phone, good luck. It's a coin flip. I, I would suggest if you're going to do the entirety of the bike route that you or somebody in your team or, you know, 
somebody in your vehicle probably has access to an AT&T phone and you should be good to go. So I'll go ahead and pause and see if there's any questions or comments and I'll go back on mute. Thank you so much, Chip, um, and uh, thank you for, for your work and, and showing us the map um, of, um, of, of the mobile connectivity and the uh, broadband assessments. So um, from Chip and um, Chip, I want to make sure that, um, you know, if you have more that you would like to cover, you know, by 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 all means, uh, something that I wanted to mention um, as Chip was was talking, was that part of part of this work was not just to do uh, the very comprehensive, detailed assessments that uh, Chip showed you a, a portion of, uh, both for broadband in each of the local communities where we're working, and then mobile connectivity along the route. But part of the work under ARPEG was providing technical assistance to these communities about what are the things that as a local community uh, they could do to enhance or at least alleviate um, some of the problems they were having in terms of access to to broadband. We know that broadband access has been in the forefront of policy and funding recently because of the impact of COVID on um, having people to work remote, having students to do uh, remote school. Uh, and we know that our rural communities has have been uh, disproportionately impacted by the lack of broadband uh, and mobile connectivity. Many, many people along these routes and in these communities rely uh, with, on their phones um, to connect to broadband and to connect to access the internet um, and uh, work, do school, and uh, even conduct business and do the activities that you know people need to do in communities to thrive. Um, so part of the technical assistance included options. What what are the options that these communities had? Um, what are some maybe low hanging fruit? Uh, projects that the communities could implement as we are seeing uh, significant investment of broadband at the federal and state and local levels. Um, and and what, are, what were things that could improve uh, connectivity for locals, uh, but also uh, connectivity for tourists um, that would be riding uh, across this this route um, and, and that was important so that as Chip mentioned uh, there was an element of safety for for riders uh, but there was also the element of helping riders uh, and, and those not living in these communities know what assets and what uh, tourism assets were were in the communities what are the cool things about all of these communities that are worthwhile stopping for um, and then in turn for the communities develop um, economic development through tourism. Uh, so just wanted to mention that Chip, just wanted to be mindful if you had um, anything else that you wanted to cover uh, before we transition into examples of some of those low hanging fruit projects that communities are doing um, to improve broadband and placemaking. OK, I think I'll take the silence as a confirmation and yeah. uh, that will be great because uh, I think it gives us a little bit of time to discuss some of the examples. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we wanted to to provide this context about the RPIC project uh, that is facilitating the, some of some of this work. Um, and like Lisa mentioned, you know, a lot of the work that I'm going to describe uh, in the next couple of slides wouldn't be possible if there wasn't uh, if, the, if those organizations and more organizations that were not reflected in the slide where Lisa had all of the partnership development hadn't already been working in these communities for years. Um, and that is just a testament to uh, how community development, and I've seen this in my career, uh, takes, takes time. Uh, it takes time to show fruits, uh, but when it does, it's worthwhile, and it's worthwhile because we're improving the livelihoods of, of rural residents. And so um you know i wanted to i wanted to close our time together by providing some examples of what the local communities are doing and when i say what local communities are doing i truly mean it uh lisa uh chip 
Dave and all the other organizations that are working with us in this project are, are, are facilitators of this work. But like Lisa said, this is something that is driven at the local level. And so these communities are actively engaged in making their communities places where people want and can live. And these few examples, they don't encompass all the work that's happening behind the scenes or all the projects that they're doing, but we wanted to highlight a couple uh, just to show you how placemaking and broadband can be are critical um, to leverage statewide initiatives like the USBR 80. So I'll start by by talking about one of the communities where I've worked um, over the last uh, three years, even before ARPICT um, was a project, and that is the city of Stuttgart um, in, in Arkansas. And uh, Windrock had been engaged in Stuttgart for, as I said, three years through another uh, USDA funded project called Strive. It was capacity assistance project to, to municipal leaders um, in the community. And as part of that technical assistance, there were a lot of assessments that were conducted about the local economy, the assets of the community, the needs of the community, and something that came to light, including broadband, um, was the the focus of the community to improve downtown uh, redevelopment uh, and to make downtown a place where people wanted to spend time could spend time uh, with the goal, and we were working with the local chamber of commerce in this project, with the goal of improving um, local businesses that were along Main Street. Uh, and that was a big, big priority for the community. How could we support the many small businesses that are here in town? Uh, and and make them have more success. And part of that was building the environment around Main Street. And so through that project and through work that other organizations like the, the University of Central Arkansas, uh, Centers for Community and Economic Development, UAM Span, Craft and Toll did, uh, they conducted a walk audit um, to go around Main Street and see what were some of the areas of the built environment that needed improvement uh, to truly make it accessible uh, and truly be a place where people could walk, could use alternate modes of transportation, didn't involve just cars, and that would really promote um, new business development and business and business growth downtown. So from that uh, walk audit, which happened before uh, ARPIC even took place and was, as I said, led by UCA and UMS Band and Craft and Toll, um, it, it reiterated uh, some of the concerns and the, the priorities that the community had around the redevelopment of downtown. And so in our pick, what we're doing with Stuttgart and what Stuttgart has been leading, especially the Stuttgart Chamber of Commerce, um, is taking an, the results from those assessments and the walk audit um, to more to implementation. Uh, and that includes, that includes- I can't three more. That's the thing about stopping and eating like that. Oh, there is some background noise, but that includes doing time. a top up of um of what maybe doing some improvements to crosswalks along main street uh would look like uh that would support better safety for pedestrians uh increasing access for people of different abilities um and that would be supportive of a more walkable downtown um with uh craft and toll and uams span we all, we did a uh a pop-up also of the pocket park uh and a pocket park it was envisioned by the community in an empty lot um, that is just right on, on, on Main Street um, and near to a lot of restaurants and businesses that are downtown. And the community wanted to see if that could be an, a, a recreational attraction or a community amenity that residents and people that were cycling through could use to uh, really uh, spend time and then uh, have the opportunity to visit all the other things that are available in Stuttgart. So Craft and Toll, UMS Fan and Windrock through the USDA uh, RPIC project did a pop-up um, of that pocket park, how it would look, uh, what amenities the community wanted to see in that in that area, and, um, and, and then 
and like Lisa mentioned, uh, the cool thing is that after community feedback of that pop-up in the crosswalks, uh, the, the city of, of Stuttgart and the Stuttgart Chamber of Commerce submitted an application to actually fund the construction of that pocket park, and that's under review at the moment. We're, we're hopeful that it will be funded, uh, but a lot of community effort went into that process too, uh, from racing match to organizing the, the logistics of the pop-up, getting community buy-in, getting community feedback into what they wanted to see in the pop-up, up and connect it to broadband, um, the, the city uh, has committed that if the, the construction of the park takes place, they were going to include uh, hotspots um, in the park so that people could use um, uh, internet in, in the park, uh, whether they were locals or they were tourists, um, and use that as another amenity uh, to enhance broadband in, in the community. So, Next, um, I think we can turn it over to Lisa to talk about some of the work that has happened in Helena, West Helena. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, we have um, been working collaboratively with Winrock International, with Thrive, with UAMS Span, with Craft and Toll, with the Cooperative Extension, with um, CDC's other uh, grant hop uh, to really work in Helena, West Helena. They were at a little bit of a different place uh, than some of the other communities. And I know you see this map to the left and you're like, if they're talking about USBR 80, why are they showing Helena, West Helena that's way off of the route? It's because of the Delta Heritage Trail that um, comes into uh, Helena, West Helena to their Delta, the state park. But then they also have the Mississippi River Trail. And then they have another designated bike trail. And then we helped uh, fund the Harbor View Trail. And so we were doing all of this work but there was no cohesiveness. There was nothing that brought it together. So when Michelle had mentioned they were going after USDA um, RPIC uh, grant, you know, and let's talk about some communities, you know, immediately we jumped on Helena, West Helena, because there was a disconnect and we needed to connect them. And we had done the master pedestrian bicycle plan and we needed to implement it. Uh, Thrive had done Harbor View Trail. Hop that I mentioned had done signage for Harbor View Trail. So there was already movement going, but we needed to take it a step forward. And so when Chip did the broadband, it brought up an opportunity through them um, doing um, some water uh, work and the mayor saying, well, we're already doing this. We're already constructing this. Let's have hot spots." And so because of the work that Chip did, it just pushed forward the thinking of we started with a walk audit. We did a pop up event. We did the master pedestrian bicycle plan. We worked with Thrive. Now we're implementing the master pedestrian plan uh, through Winrock International. We're doing um, uh, an economic development plan. Through Thrive, we're doing the trail uh, uh, De, uh, wayfinding design and then the community is going to purchase the signs so they can get from Delta Heritage Trail using the trail system to downtown and then Winrock International has done uh, funded this beautiful mur mural here that says Helena plays outside and that was done through partnership with Thrive and then uh, they also based off the master pedestrian bicycle plan that UAMS Span paid for, gave it to Winrock International and said, hey, why don't you work with Thrive to fund some of the crosswalk art 
that we've identified. Um, and so, again, this is just opportunities to show how all these different partnerships come together and meet. And I would be remorse if I didn't mention that one of the things that we really, really learned, not only through COVID, but through CHIP's great work, is that we needed to really look at inclusion, diversity, and equity. Um, and there was a huge disconnect, um, and it was uh, with people of color and low socioeconomic individuals. And I am proud to say that each of these communities has taken ownership of that. They have bought into being equitable, diverse, and inclusive, and are going as far as the mayor of Helena, West Helena, and the hotspots, covering the cost. Michelle will talk about England and what they're doing. So being part of the uh, Walk Action Institute with UAMS, Span, and Windrock International, and having our state team, we were able to spread that information and really get communities to understand and open their eyes and have those difficult conversations. And I'll turn it back to Michelle. Yeah, and thank you, Lisa, for bringing up um, the 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 importance of, of equity through all of this. Um, you know, there's equity in the sense of uh, this being rural communities that are disproportionately impacted and also communities uh, where people of color uh, had been marginalized uh, historically and the, the seeing local communities uh, take action and in, 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 in this regard has been uh, inspiring. Um, so I wanted to also uh, give a shout out to uh, the city of Lone Oak. I know some some of the people from Lone Oak are here and they could have a presentation of their own, uh, but something that Lone Oak has been doing for a while now and really driven by local um, leadership uh, around the community and being very, uh, very cognizant and, and, and purposeful about inclusion um, is that they've been going through this through a process of simultaneous and ongoing planning and implementation of placemaking. So Lonoc started with uh, their Lonoc 2022 plan uh, and with support of many other organizations before ARPIC, before Windrock was involved, um, they had been uh, planning for their downtown redevelopment and how to really be a community where uh, people would want to stop uh, looking at any anywhere from design uh, designing of trailheads um, that would connect them uh, into into the the trails and the routes uh, looking into beautification uh, infrastructure uh, you name it. Uh, they have gone uh, above and beyond and have set up a, a really, really good model for community engagement by um, setting up committees to achieve each of the priorities that they had uh, under the Lone Oak 2022 plan and have made a lot of progress. And as part of that progress, uh, we're helping them a little bit more towards implementation um, and, and, and continuing that planning with uh, the bike ped plan that UAMS, SPAN, uh, and ARPIC are, are conducting with the city of Lone Oak and also supporting them through technical assistance in their own local um, placemaking activities. And you see a couple of pictures that are hard to read um, on the screen, but you know they they have done a lot of placemaking art um uh, you know really building up local businesses like the grumpy rabbit restaurant um, which is a great amenity in town um and doing activities that support just all of the assets that are that are downtown and um and lonok is is well on their way uh to being a community that is fully connected uh with broadband which facilitates a lot of this great work um and as they are developing the bike ped plan uh, we'll see that implementation is is starting to take place 
Um, something else that I wanted to mention um, and moving into the city of England, um, the city of England wa was and is a little bit more into uh, the planning phases of, of development and, and placemaking in contrast to uh, the city of Lone Oak or the city of Stark Garden, city of Helena was Helena, uh, but uh, part of their in their in part of their planning efforts, something that I, we wanted to highlight here is that they are trying to reimagine their community and the spaces that they have to be um, more community amenities. And one of those examples is what it's been called the the England blacktop, um, and it used to be the location of a former chem, uh, chemical plant that has now been, um, you know removed and uh, paved with asphalt, so a blacktop, uh, and the community in their in their planning and through the, the walk audit um, and the technical assistance in this project have really taken an interest in transforming that empty space into a community space, uh, adding shade uh, through pavilions and most recently, uh, because they know how important broadband is, adding hotspots um, into that space to make it more usable and attract people um, uh, to spend time in that in in that physical location, um, and and that is just really one of the uh, examples of uh, projects that England is is doing through this work. Um, and in addition to this work, they're now working with UMS Span. Um, really, in addition to this work, to do a, a, a bike pet plan, um, and that will take them into the next the next stage to really look at their community, uh, look at all the infrastructure and see how, what can be transformed, how it can be transformed to support uh, walkability and all their uh, types of uh, transportation. So we're staying tuned with with the city of England. Uh, I wish you could uh, you could see all the effort that the local coalition is doing into gathering community uh, input uh, about the blacktop, but about all the other um, community and placemaking projects that they're doing through surveys and engaging all areas of the community. So, um, you know, another great example of um, of placemaking and community development. So I see that we are at the 1224 mark. So we wanted to save a little bit of time for for questions and discussion. So um, uh, my colleague Jordan Williams, who I will give a huge, huge shout out uh, because she was the driving force in making this webinar happen uh, and really imagining the concept for this webinar. She will be moderating the um, the questions and discussion. So bring it on participants and ask us away. Thanks, Michelle. And um... I, there aren't currently any questions in the chat. There are several good comments, so thank you guys for those. But if you have a question and you want to come unmute, um, feel free to um, just unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand and I can call on you. This is Jessica in Louisiana. I think it was Lisa that talked about mayors being on board in the process. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. At what point of this whole project were the, the mayors and the, the city commissioners kind of brought in? From the very beginning, um, we learned years and years ago that in order for policy systems and environmental changes to happen, you had to have the municipality on board. So we developed a model that um, that the, we had to have a sit down meeting with the mayor to find out their visions, what they were looking at and uh, see and make sure they were on board. So before we go into any community, we have that one on one with the mayor and we ask them to bring in a city council member or an influential um, community member. And when I say influential community member, I mean somebody who is boots on the ground, who's willing to do work, all of that. Um, and the reason we make the superintendent be involved and at the table at all times is because in Arkansas, and I don't know how it is, um, in any other state, but in Arkansas, I mean, in the rural communities, 
kids are walking across highways to get to schools and it is dangerous. And so we've got to safely transport those kids from neighborhoods to the schools. And so we just decided very early on and we have been very um, successful with policy systems and environmental changes with this model by having these mayors on board. Now, that being said, we back up our technical assistance with uh, SPAN money to help support these communities. So that does help as well. And if I may add, um, you know, uh, having having municipal leadership uh, engaged at every stage is critical and their support is critical, but it's also critical to build the capacity of um, those engaged uh, residents as well so that whatever happens at the municipal level, whether there is turnover that has happened in some of my communities, that capacity assistance stays on the ground and is still community driven, driving the work. Um, so that's part of the technical assistance that we've had. We've formed local coalitions that include municipal leaders, but also non-elected officials in the work so that the, 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 the actual work is being led by and done by uh, the, the city itself. And I, I wanted to give a shout out um, to Stuttgart because here's a huge policy change that by the work with Winrock International and UAMS SPAM, they were able to reallocate $31 million for the Main Street revitalization for street design and drainage. And that's huge, guys. I mean, that kind of money to be reallocated, that is sustainable for 20 years down the road. And that includes, uh, you know, that pocket park in the downtown area. And those are the kind of changes we need to make. And that's why it's so important to have the municipal um, municipality on board so that those kind of huge changes can take place and we help them through it um you know throughout the steps and that's how you get economic development that's how you make changes uh you know and I, that's just in one example but i just wanted to show you why it's so important yeah Thanks, Lisa, for that example, and thank you, Jessica, for that question. Um, again, that could probably be a whole presentation unto itself of building community engagement and who at the, the grassroots level is important. Um, we have a couple other questions in the chat, and I know we're um, at our 1230 time, um, so our, all of our presenters will be happy to stay on and answer questions, but um, I just wanted to make that note in case anyone had other engagements, feel free to roll off as needed. Um, so going back to the first question that I see, Mr. Brent Hugh asked, how did the coalition behind this project originally come together? Was there an agency or person that kicked off the whole thing? Um, and if I, uh, Brent, if I can ask a clarifying question, did you mean specific to a community or did you mean um, the RPIC project in general? If you're still on. Yeah, uh, uh, the whole project statewide. Okay, um, Michelle, would you like to answer that? Sure, I think uh, that's something that we have a, a unique benefit in Arkansas for being a small state, but a small state with a lot of organizations that are committed to this kind of work. Um, and so this this coalition was really started because um, we talk to each other. We uh, we have, I think, a couple of years of meetings, just informal conversations with uh, UAMS Fan, with Craft and Toll, with UCA, uh, and many of the organizations that um, Lisa showed on that slide with all the logos before this even happened. And you know, I think something that was critical is that we all knew what each of our organizations were doing, and then were asked 
as we were talking, just trying to determine, OK, how could we work together to amplify the work that each of us are doing, but doing it together? Um, and it really was just that intentionality of uh, speaking to each other. Uh, and I think that's that's something that we can brag about in Arkansas. Um, you know, that we, we have a lot of great organizations that are willing to work together uh, to enhance our state. And and having our dot on on board wasn't easy. It took years and years of knocking on the door and keep on pushing, but we got them to take some baby steps. And so I strongly, um, you know, tell ask you to do that um, because that's important to be involved, which means. You have to go sit at their public meetings, listen to their projects, those kind of things. I did see something about hospitals, um, Tim. I obviously I work at UAMS, uh, which is a hospital uh, with SPAN. We do reach out to them, but what we've learned is they're so busy that we wait till we get some plans you know, kind of moving and then we bring them in um, and we offer uh, prescriptions for nutrition, prescriptions for physical activity. We do um, community assessments that show them where free physical activity could be, that it's safe, well lit. And and so we bring them in at that point. There are some communities that the leadership of a clinic or a hospital is so monumental that they are a real guiding force to push changes in the built environment um, because of the health component. As you probably know, all chronic diseases risk factors are physical activity and nutrition. And so, yes, you are absolutely correct and uh, we do. Uh, this was just more about, I mean, we could give a whole nother presentation on how we get the major hospitals and then the rural clinics. You know, we do um, all kinds of initiatives with physical activity, with nutrition, with clinics um, and hospitals. So, but yes, thank you. Thanks for answering that, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Reese Brewer, who said we're looking forward to the Hub City work for USBR 51 in the future. Um, we are as well for um, yeah. people in the state or for people outside the state. USBR 80 is just one piece of several of the USBR network that um, lots of people are working on getting designated. Um, both north, south, and east, west in several locations across our state. So, you know, we also highlight this work as not just something that is geographically specific to this mid delta region of Arkansas, um, but as work that um, can be done across Arkansas or other states um, as well. And I wanted to mention um, that you have to have the bordering state on board. So, you know, you have to work with other DOTs of other states. I just wanted to put that out there so that people knew that um, to get the USBR 80 approved. We had to have the Tennessee DOT uh, give us a letter of support so that we could attach to Memphis through that. So I just wanted to let everybody know that's part of the process. A, that's a good note. It's a it's a long term process. Um, those are all the questions that I see in the chat. Um, is there anyone else who would like to come and mute and ask something? Well, I waited the five seconds until it feels <laughs> awkward and makes someone want to speak and no one did. Um, so I will just close and say thank you guys so much for joining us virtually today. Um, we'll follow up with a link uh, of this recording so that you guys have it. Um, 
feel free to reach out to any of our presenters today if you would like to have a longer conversation about this work or how any of it was accomplished or if you're in a community in Arkansas or in a neighboring state, we'd love to talk to you more and potentially work with you. So thank you so much for your time and um, we'll connect later. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.